I'm with Shmuel Bowman from Operation Life Shield. Now, Shmuel, what is Operation Life Shield? So first and foremost, Operation Life Shield is a grassroots response to the Second Lebanon War uh, that happened in 2006 when we found ourselves in a situation where thousands of rockets were hitting northern Israel over a period of about a month, displacing about 300,000 Israelis from northern Israel. And a group of volunteers, Israelis, Americans, uh, myself, a Canadian Israeli, wanted to know how we could help. And so we approached the IDF, or as it was called, the, uh, the Home Front Command, and uh, we asked them, what can we do? And they said, well, we clearly see that the way people are taking shelter is going to change drastically. We cannot have a situation anymore where people literally move into an underground bunker for a month. Uh, gone are those days. Uh, what we really need is a situation where, you know, if uh, you and I are having coffee somewhere and the siren goes off, we leave everything on the table. You leave your recording thing, you leave your camera, we leave everything on the, on the table. We run into a nearby, above-ground, accessible shelter where we wait out the threat or the attack. It could be 10 minutes, it could be an hour, whatever it is. And then uh, when the danger passes, we return to our lives. We, basically, what we try to do is live as normal a life as possible uh, in an abnormal situation. And we stepped up to the plate and we said, we want, we want in, we want to do this, and we want to take this on. And since, really, since 2006, this has been our mission, to save lives, protect lives by providing accessible above-ground shelters. So it was really born out of a need then, wasn't it? Totally. Um, it, was, it was a response. There comes a time when, when you see something, right? The Bible talks about, you know, the prophet saying, He nani, here I am. And you have to say, here I am. And I'm not waiting for anybody else to do this. This is what I've been called to do. And that means that I'm faced with a situation where I can respond. We just felt that the government of Israel doesn't need to be responsible for everything. I know that sounds in our day and age kind of crazy that, uh, you know, everything should be the government's responsibility, no matter what government you're, you know, under. But we just felt that, no, regular, ordinary citizens can do something too. And, and so we've taken that as our response. So it was definitely as a, as a reaction. Now, today, some 12 and a half years later, we're actually more proactive than we are reactive. Was this pioneering work when you started doing it? Oh, totally. I mean, we, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, we, uh, we really didn't know what we were doing. We kind of experimented as we went along. We were, uh, we were building shelters. I have to tell you, looking back at some of our older shelters, which are strong and do the job, but they were way too heavy. The materials were probably too costly. Um, now we've really got it down to a science. So we work with several different manufacturers uh, to, uh, uh, to, make, to get it right. But yeah, at the beginning, uh, we, were, we, were, we were the uh, trailblazers. When we first started putting in shelters in Sterot, for example, they were using... Uh, cement sewer pipes, okay, the ones that are supposed to be buried underground that are meant for sewage and water, and that's what they were using. The municipality was using those products to ha to take shelter in. They're completely inefficient in terms of shelters. We came along and we came up with shelters that were specifically designed to be above ground and accessible. What does it cost for a shelter? Prices range anywhere from a bell shelter which is exactly as the name describes, looks like a bell. And they're small, and they go for about uh, $18,000 U.S. And all the way up. I mean, we're, we're using different size shelters. We've got cuboid. I learned what a cuboid is. That's a three-dimensional rectangle. Cuboid-shaped shelters that go for about twenty two, twenty three thousand dollars $23,000. Some of them are made out of steel-reinforced concrete. Some of them are made out of um, special steel material developed by, um, by, you know, by experts in the field. We are involved with also materials from 3M, special uh, over, over glass materials as well. And we're using other new sophisticated materials, which I actually cannot discuss their composites because they're cl it's classified information. But this is new, new lightweight materials that we're able to literally build a bomb shelter from the inside out, from inside a kindergarten, from inside a sports center and build it from the inside out. So we're doing all sorts of stuff, in the, and prices range. The good news is is that anybody who's interested in, in participating and in helping and being involved, it's not an all-or-nothing situation because all we do are bomb shelters and those kind of projects. So that means 100% of 
all donations wind up going exactly to that and that alone, which means that we can partner people together. We can bring together um, any amount of money, any amount of a gift can be partnered in order for us to get a shelter up and running. These are quite expensive for a family who maybe wants to take shelter in one, isn't it? That a family couldn't really afford to buy one privately by themselves. Right. So we absolutely never, ever, never, ever provide a shelter for a private family. Never. That is their responsibility or something they need to be working worked out with uh, the government. We provide shelters for public spaces only, whether it's to uh, bus stops, parks, swimming pools, synagogues, mosques, churches, kindergartens, medical clinics, anything which is a uh, public area, uh, that's, our, that's, our, that's our turf. Um, when it comes to private, if somebody calls me and they're more than welcome to, I'll simply refer them to a manufacturer and they'll make their own arrangements. Where do you place these shelters today in Israel? Listen, our number one priority is the Gaza Belt area. This is an area if you... The government of Israel is responsible for providing public shelters up to seven kilometers or five miles from the Gaza border. But the fact of the matter is is that the rocket's range is much, much greater than that, which means everything from 7.1 kilometers and on to about 40-kilometer range is an area that we're concerned about. That area has a population of approximately one million Israelis. It goes all the way to Beersheba in the east and all the way up to Ashdod and, in fact, even further uh, to the north and Kiryat Gat as well to the, to, the, uh, to the northeast. So it's a wide range, and that's the area that we're most concerned about. We're also uh, putting shelters in northern Israel. There's a serious, serious concern regarding Hezbollah, which has approximately 150,000 rockets aimed at Israel. Yeah, and it's a real serious problem to the point where people are thinking twice about whether or not they're going to go to the community center. I mean, you and I, you know, and your listeners may think about, hey, I think I'll go over to the community center and go do an art course or go to the pool, go play some tennis or play some cards or whatever. Guess what? You're going to think twice about it if there's no shelter nearby. So we're interested in making sure that spaces like that have shelters so that you know, I don't know what Hezbollah is going to do. I don't know what Syria is going to do. So that's what I call about being kind of preparation and being proactive. We're going to get the shelters there before we're under attack. Are they portable? Can you move them to different locations? So we call them transportable. Uh, it's not the sort of thing you'd hitch onto the back of your car like a Winnebago trailer, but they, uh, they're all, all of them are designed to be moved. They can be moved from one location to the other and quite easily and rather uh, inexpensively. As per the recommendation of the Army or other needs, let's say, for example, you have, and we have this all the time, you have a shelter on, in a residential area, and this happened um, a couple of years ago in the city of Nitivot in the Gaza Belt area. And they said, hey, our top priority is the main street, the main business district of Nitivot. That's where we need those shelters. And so they literally put them up on trucks and move them a few kilometers over. And that's the beauty of these things. They can be moved to exactly where they're needed. Is it sometimes not necessarily the rocket that kills, but the shrapnel that comes from it that kills? It's usually the shrapnel that kills. You know... <laughs> If you get hit by by a rocket directly, it's kind of like um, it's like winning the lottery, except bad. I mean, the 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 odds are really, really quite slim that there'll be a direct hit. Uh, however, shrapnel is an indiscriminate explosion, and it's spraying in every direction. What the enemy is doing, which is totally against uh, every international law, the Geneva Convention, and every every law that's connected to uh, humanity, is that they're packing these rockets with shrapnel that includes ball bearings, uh, screws, nails, and there have been ca occasions when some of this material is even laced with rat poisoning. There's this new material I saw recently. It's horrific, and it landed actually near a kindergarten. It's a piece of twisted metal, and what it does is as it explodes, it, it actually spins so that when it actually hits the person, not only does it impact the person, but continues to cut and slice through the person when it gets to them. This is, these things are aimed at kindergartens, and this is what's going on. And yeah, you know, uh, when people get killed or lose limbs, it's really because of uh, shrapnel spray. Now, we know Gaza is a very uh, poverty-stricken area. Where did they get these rockets from? Yeah, so uh, first what they're doing is they're taking the uh, incredible amount of money that actually has come in their direction, and instead of using it for building medical clinics, clean water, education, or residential facilities, they're doing two things with it. They're, they're, they're building tunnels so that they can um, launch terror attacks, 
and they're manufacturing or purchasing rockets. While these rockets we see are coming from Iran, and they're coming through tunnels that are popping up on the Egyptian side. The Egyptian government in, of late has been flooding those tunnels so that they can't access them, but they're also coming in by boat. They're getting them, and they're also manufacturing rockets. Uh, but that's where they're spending their funds on, on things like this. Uh, to make a rocket these days, they've got the technology to do it, um, so they know what they're doing. And together with purchased materials, they're able to produce quite a, quite a lot of rockets. So this is, this is a very, very, very unfortunate. And yeah, for a poverty-stricken area, an area of 2 million Palestinians who are held in a terror dictatorship where there hasn't been free elections in over a decade is absolutely inhumane. Mm. Yeah. Uh, what is the distance of a rocket? We see them coming from Gaza. Can they reach places like Jerusalem as well? Yeah, the larger-range rockets, which are called the Fajar 5s, can reach uh, Jerusalem, or they can reach Tel Aviv, north of Tel Aviv, and there's no problem whatsoever in those rockets. We've had rockets uh, being launched from Gaza into Jerusalem area, and people say, wow, that's pretty crazy. I mean, there's aren't there Arab Muslims in, in Jerusalem that could be targeted and could be affected? And the answer is yes. And like, what can I tell you? The terrorists in Gaza don't seem to care about their own family. So it's, it's really, again, it, it's a deal, we're dealing with a human rights issue, and we're dealing with a humanity issue. And we're dealing with people who have zero respect for those, co- for, for those values. And uh, all we're doing is saving lives. And, and by the way, when we save lives, we're talking about protecting lives of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. We, uh, rockets don't know the difference if they're going to hit a Bedouin village beside, beside Beersheba, or a Jewish kibbutz uh, near uh, Ashkelon. It doesn't know the difference. We're concerned about saving and protecting all lives. Everybody's created in the image of God. How important are these shelters to the community, and how many have you provided so far? So its importance to the community often makes the difference as to whether or not a parent takes their child to kindergarten or school that day. Now, that has tremendous socioeconomic factors, because if you're a a double-income family, and um, now you're making a decision that because there isn't a shelter at that kindergarten, so now one of the parents is now going to stay home, which means they're not earning an income for that day or week or whatever it is, which means at the end of the month they're not paying the grocery bill or electrical bill, which creates this downward economic spiral. Now, that's not a matter of life and death, but it does have a serious impact, a socioeconomic impact on the community, which is otherwise resolved if a shelter had been there. Other issues, for example, of like, you know, hey, should we... Should we actually, you know, go shopping to buy groceries? Should we go to this event? Are there shelters or are there not shelters? It's a matter of, it is a matter of life and death. And so that is going to impact, uh, life. you know, you can have the most beautiful community you want in southern Israel, flowers and parks and gardens and swimming pools. It could be absolutely the most gorgeous, gorgeous place, okay? Got news for you. If there isn't a sense of security, no one's going to live there. Okay, so we play a major role, shelters play a major role in actually whether or not people are going to be living in their communities. And again, I want to emphasize whether it's Jews or, or Muslims or if it's Christian pilgrims coming to Israel or whether it's foreign workers from Thailand. We don't care. People, people's lives are what matters. As far as how many, at this point in time, we have successfully placed or constructed over 400 shelters in Israel. Wow. And... Um do you get to visit the cities like Starot to see your shelters in action? So I'm, I travel a lot, <laughs> um, both outside of Israel and within Israel. I'm in Sterot. I'm in all the municipalities and regional areas in the Gaza Belt area on a weekly basis. I'm also, I, have, I also have a telephone a conversation, meeting and update with at least one of the security chiefs of the cities or municipalities in the region on a, on a, on a daily basis. Uh, now, you've also had a letter from the Prime Minister. Tell us a bit about that. So, actually, this is our second letter from the Prime Minister. And as I looked at it, uh, actually, yesterday, I think we're actually due for another letter. The Prime Minister appreciates very much the work that we do. And he has expressed this both uh, in personal conversations, in statements uh, with groups, and, of course, in actual formal uh, official letters from the Prime Minister. Basically, what he's what he's always been communicating to us is thank you so much as just ordinary citizens for stepping in the gap and for helping 
make uh, life livable in communities that would otherwise be hijacked by by this terror. And so he's very grateful for that. And he's grateful for the fact that we have actually made a significant difference and have bettered the lives of, of all Israelis, of, of visitors, tourists, and foreign workers. Why do you do what you do? Uh, God called me to do it. <laughs> I, I mean, right? Sometimes you have, sometimes you're going, I, you, go, you know, I was going in one direction of my life. I, I'm coming from, I'm an Orthodox Jew and very involved in actually in education and still do that. I happen to be a Torah scribe and I teach about that and, and I write uh, Torah scrolls. And I guess God kind of taps you proverbially on the shoulder and says, you're going kind of in the right direction, but let me just adjust your bearings a little bit. And yeah, and it was an eye-opening experience during the Second Lebanon War uh, to realize there was something that, that I could do. There's something that my team and I could do. And I have only been blessed by this. Uh, sometimes the work is crazy. Last week, for example, when we had 700 rockets uh, you know, slam into Israel, didn't get much sleep for a few days. But you know, the rewards are amazing, and they're immediate. You see, the, you see what happens when you do not stand idly by your brother, brother's b- blood. You, you reap the benefits when, it, when in Psalms it talks about do not fear the terror by night or the arrows that fly by day. Those arrows that fly by day are enemy rockets. And that commandment, do not fear, is, is, an, is an imperative. How do you not fear? I believe by creating projects like we do that take away the fear. I think by doing that, we're fulfilling that mitzvah, that commandment. So it's just a, a total blessing to be doing this work, and who doesn't want to be blessed? What's your prayer for the future of the organization? Uh, that we're able to close up real soon. I really pray that I get a phone call one day that says, hey, uh, we've got great news. Uh, Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza and Hezbollah and all the rest of them have decided that, uh, that really peace is really the way to go, or at least tolerance, and that firing weapons at innocent people is 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 not a good strategy and we're just going to turn all these bomb shelters into into i don't know museums or really well insulated rooms for reading and study and get togethers or maybe we'll gladly donate all these shelters to create a uh, a seaport in gaza so that they can bring in shipping and, and create a great economy i would love that to happen i would love i've got other things I, I'd, I'd like to do in the meantime this is the calling. This is what I need to be doing. But my prayer is, is that one day this will be a chapter in a history book. And uh, what's your website for people who'd like to know more, perhaps they'd like to give? So our website is operationlifeshield.org. Operationlifeshield.org. And, yeah, we, we basically do what we do because people who really want to make a difference, who really want to take any amount of money in any currency, it doesn't matter, and be part of, of saving lives and protecting lives. When you ask me about my prayer, my prayer is, is really that we should have the fortitude and the resilience to be able to go on each day and to be able to live life fully until peace happens, that we should really be strong and resilient. And that resilience is, and that sense of encouragement comes when we see people from all over the world who say, I want to help. Here, here's whatever, $10, $100, 500 euro, you know, 300 pounds, 25 pesos. It doesn't matter. Whatever it happens to be, every every amount of money is a blessing and helps us. We couldn't do it without you. We absolutely couldn't do it without you. Okay, Shmuel, thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. God bless you. Shalom and peace uh, for the entire world.